Hello everyone. Uh, today I'm going to uh, talk about uh, crash analysis using ANSA and LS Dyna. So this is going to be, uh, and I guess we said it's going to be a webinar for around 45 minutes. Let me start right away. Here is the topics on which uh, I'll be touching over today. Uh, first will be an introduction. The contents I was going through uh, was uh, introduction, a little bit of the overview of the topic, then a few fundamentals in the field of crash analysis. And then I'll talk about a case study on which I worked on. And then we'll go into state of the art, what is going on in the field right now? What is the state of the art, what we compare to in crash analysis? And then what is the future evolution? And then a career path and opportunities uh, in the field. The, everybody will have the first this thing, question of uh, what is crash analysis? So crash analysis is nothing but it's a branch of finite element analysis which involves a vehicular crash where uh, there is multiple load cases that has to be evaluated before a vehicle is allowed by an OEM to be sold. So every OEM has to do their crash analysis, but the CAE side, they have to do the physical testing. So the crash analysis in this branch, which deals with vehicular crash, we simulate uh, what happens in uh, the physical world uh, using finite element tools. So that is the branch of crash analysis. And why do we use crash analysis is, will be the next biggest question uh, anybody would ask. And there are three important points for it. The first one is the cost reduction. So the vehicular stage um, usually typically goes on from three to five years, the developmental phase. And at each phase, like that would be a pro, uh, uh, each gate of the vehicle development, that would be uh, maybe like six to eight months. You have to do crash analysis to validate whatever designs have been developed till that point. So if you imagine that at every stage, the OEM has to build at least like 10 to 12 prototypes of the vehicle and then do a physical crash analysis on it. And uh, pretty soon you'll be burning through a lot of cash by just doing the crash analysis at every stage. So to offset that is what uh, they developed long back was the part of crash analysis where you would build a, like a finite element model and that could be used to validate the initial uh, prototype, initial design phases of the vehicle. And it saves a lot of money for the OEMs because back in the days uh, when it was a developmental phase for a vehicle, uh, they would use at least 100 to 200 prototypes to do the crash analysis. And nowadays uh, it's come down to maybe like at the most 20 or 40 vehicles. So if you consider that, it's like a huge reduction in cost for the vehicle developmental process. And the next thing is repeatability. So as I said, it's an FE model, which you can uh, do a crash analysis almost pretty much every day. You come up with a new design, you do the analysis, uh, evaluate the, build the model and evaluate it overnight. And then you'll have the results next day for the designers. And you can go over the results and see what works, what doesn't work. And you can tear the model apart and see what exactly is happening. What is crushing? What is not crushing? Where is the stack up happening? And you can evaluate all that. And then you can start the process again. Uh, if it doesn't work out, you can go back to your design board really quick and keep iterating this process again and again. So that's the, this thing about repeatability. And the last point is the quick design iterations. What, like I mentioned in the previous point, if you have a design, you can immediately put it into your model, run the analysis, and then get the results in almost like one day or two days. And you can say if this, is, this design works or it doesn't work. In a developmental, vehicle developmental process, if you need to cut down the whole developmental cycle, you need to have this quick design iterations turnaround. Otherwise, it's going to take a long time to develop the vehicles. Before in GM, the vehicle development times used to be around five years. Now it's come down to almost like three years. So people are in different OEMs are trying to always see ways where they can cut down the vehicle developmental process because they want to get the product as soon as possible to the market. Let's go to the next this thing. Overview of what happens exactly in crash analysis. So what does crash analysis actually entail? Like if you become a crash engineer, this would be like a typical day at work. So uh, the first part would be the meshing. Whenever there is a new CAD which is developed, you need to have that part meshed and implement into the model. Or sometimes if it's a, a, like a, a gate, 
you the whole model will be dumped to you and a team of engineers will build a full vehicle model so that will involve the very first basic step of creating a meshed model and then once the meshing is complete you come to the model assembly that is where uh, you have to put all the individual parts together to make sub assemblies and uh, then once the sub assemblies are assembled then you put it plug it into the full vehicle when you do this assembly it's each part is put together the joint has to be represented very accurately and some of the places uh, example in the suspensions you have to represent all the kinematics without the proper representation of the kinematics you're not going to uh, get the way the suspension will behave in real life so all that has to be calibrated and modeled in detail for the model to work like how it works in real life so next stage is the analysis part once the model is fully assembled and ready and then you have run your test iterations and validated the model then comes the analysis part where you depending upon the load case you're uh, impacting the vehicle into the or you're impacting it with into uh, with a different vehicle or a rigid wall then you'd set up the model uh, set up your velocities and then you run the analysis so that is the third part once the analysis is complete which would uh, depending upon the size of the model and the detail uh, in the model it would usually take 24 hours to complete um that's the max i have seen but depending upon the model it can take longer and then once the model is, analysis is complete you come to the post processing part where you take the results from the model and then you extract all the necessary uh, results and then you plot the results and prepare your presentation the last step is something called as correlation this is what you do with crashed physical tests so once you have an a finite element model you need to have an understanding of how good the model is compared to your physical crash test so once the physical crash test is done you overlay your physical crash test results on your fe results and then you find out the we something uh, we do it for uh, usually the velocity uh, curves and then acceleration curves something called as a cora rating and it gives a like by how much the test and the uh, ca pulses are different and by plotting this you get an understanding of how good your model is the closer the better then you will ha- uh, the the oem will have a lot of confidence on the model which has been built and then you can kind of avoid doing physical test and sign off most of the things based only on the finite element results and there are oems uh, as of today which do that so that's why it's very important to do this correlation part where you're comparing the physical crash test with the finite element results going to the next okay let's jump into some of the fundamentals i'll talk about some of the basic fundamentals in crash analysis used today so the first and foremost would be the kinetic energy equation which is half mv squared this is a pretty much very important equation because straight of the bat because the vehicle is always in motion and velocity comes in there and then it's either impacting uh, another barrier or it's impacting a rigid wall and to know wh- how much energy is transferred at the impact time uh, we need to know uh this kinetic energy equation because using this is when we come to know um the energy which is uh, dissipated uh, what the wall would be seeing or the what the barrier would be seeing and this equation kind of becomes important when it is like a vehicle to vehicle crash because if the vehicles are imagine a scenario where these two vehicles are traveling at the same speed and they impact at each other the v and v get cancel and m is the one which will determine which vehicles get more impacted so mass comes in the that's why there is that the saying that mass always kind of wins that's why this equation is kind of important for a crash engineer to know and use uh, when he is doing all the analysis work uh, this is called as the post processing part like where acceleration velocity and displacement there here you can see a sample um, uh, i've plotted an acceleration curve bottom left hand corner that's a typical um, acceleration curve and then uh, what you see over there is i think it's an overlay of a physical test versus a uh, like a ca result maybe and then uh, the velocity curve is on on the right hand side and that's a typical velocity curve for a, a impact on a wall you would you would get a acceleration curve something similar to the so this all these curves what you see is i think based on a uh, like a frontal crash to a wall and the next part is 
the vehicle pulse, which is called as the A1 pulse and an A2 pulse. So if you look at the acceleration pulse, uh, there is two peaks. So there is one peak at 20 millisecond, and there is another peak at around 40 millisecond. So the zero to 20 millisecond is the time when there is airbags and the seat belts have not deployed and the occupant is in a free motion at this point. So at, that is the A, A1 pulse stage. And usually and typically most of the vehicles, with, they're designed in such a way that the pulse in that time zone is not a, the, like a very high peak. Because if it's a very high peak, the occupant would feel that because he's in a free motion. He doesn't have a seat belts restraining him. He doesn't have the airbags to protect him yet the, because the airbags have not deployed. That's why the, most of the OEMs uh, see to it that the first A1 pulse is less. And then next comes the stage of the A2 pulse. A2 pulse is typically higher is because that's when the vehicle is coming to a standstill, I would say, coming to a stop after hitting a wall. And that's when all the seat belts are deployed uh, and then the airbags are deployed and the occupant is kind of restrained from moving. Even if the pulse is a little bit higher in that stage, the occupant wouldn't feel it. I mean, of course, he would feel it, but then he, he wouldn't have that, like a direct um, injuries. That's what I meant to say. Also, there is another terminology which uh, a crash engineer uses on a day-to-day -day work is uh, something called as a maximum dynamic crash. Uh, this is pretty important is because Imagine a scenario where a vehicle hits wall and there is a stack up happening and components are crushing and then the front end of the vehicle to a certain extent is compressing and compressing and compressing. So from the original dimension of the vehicle to the post crash, there will be a, a difference in the dimension, right? So there, that is called as a max dynamic crush. So post crash will be the average static crush, but then the max dynamic crush is in the event, the event is not yet over. In the middle of the event, the vehicle crushes to the maximum location. And then once it bounces off the wall, it kind of relieves that some of the compression and it comes back to a little bit of the original state. And when that maximum crush is happening, that is called as the maximum dynamic crush. These are just some of the basics I went over during a crash event and uh, what a crash analysis sees in a regular day-to-day day -day work. Let's go to the next slide. Okay. Uh, this is a case study uh, which I worked on. I can just quickly talk about it. And uh, this is uh, something called as a component analysis for like the front rails. So front rails are a pretty crucial part of a front uh, vehicle design because this is the important cross members which are taking all the loads from a frontal impact. There are various frontal impacts for which the vehicle is designed for nowadays. And... Uh, it has to meet all those load cases. So there'll be like typically five to six different variants of the uh, frontal impact. And then it, depending upon each zone, like either it's US, Europe, China, India, you have to meet all those load cases if the vehicles are going to be sold in those regions. So uh, if you combine that, it's going to be like a lot and lot of load cases. So this is design of this, it becomes a very, very, very crucial. How do you approach this? Uh, first and foremost, what you have to do is take that just the rails alone as a single component by itself. And then you have to do an, something called as a crush test. And you put it between two solid cylinders and you just crush the rails itself where you will see the accordion crush happening. You can, and it is absorbing the load for which is designed for. And how do you come up with that number where you know how much is it designed for? So on the right hand side, if you see a pie chart, It'll give you a, a, this thing of uh, during a crash event, like a typical crash event, depending upon the mass of the vehicle, the energy of the vehicle was the total energy when it hit the wall was around 337 kilojoules. And then later on, if you peel the part out and then you're measuring what each rails absorbs, how much energy each part of the uh, front end of the vehicle absorbs, you would see that the crush box or your crush rails, which is in the, all the way up in the front, is the one taking majority of the load during the frontal crash event. In this example, it's taking almost like 175 kilojoules of energy. So typically in the crash analysis, if you see the graph on the left-hand side, the, the, the average energy uh, or the average force which is absorbed by the front crash box is around 250 kilonewtons. 
that is what it is designed for that it can it should take 250 kilo newtons if you make it stiffer than that uh, it wouldn't crush and occupants would feel it so you generally stay around this 250 kilo newton range so that when it crushes it'll crush easily and it'll absorb all the energy and uh, not dissipate much to the occupants the front uh, rail cross sections are designed the body structure people they'll give you an idea of how much is available for designing the cross rails based on that you would come up with the number of cross members which are required in inside the section uh, this is i'm talking about an aluminum section so you can decide the number of chambers you can decide based on this 250 kN target and you can do the uh, as many crush tests you want to come up with that design pattern once you have that design pattern then you will create something called as the front end component test which, which you can see on the right hand side that is basically your front end assembly with the bumpers and the and the crush rails uh, or the front rails and you will see it performing uh, each you can keep iterating these designs uh, till you get a good crush pattern where it is absorbing a lot of the energy with, during a crash event uh, go, going back to the graph you would see here uh, both the rails are performing as expected and this is an overlay of uh, actually the the green is the ca analysis part and then the orange is the actual crash test so if you see we are almost overlaying uh, or we are the model is highly correlated and it's following the the test pattern and that's where the testing comes in where we take this freshly newly designed uh, front rails and the bumper beam and then we mock it up maybe you you have a workshop in an oem where they can quickly develop something for you uh, put something together and then you can take it to the crash testing facility and then have it crash tested and that's how you get orange curve and once you have that orange curve you overlay it with your cae see how far you are away from the physical test and the cae analysis so this process goes on a few times till you kind of have the ca analysis um uh, the ca model which will be very closely represented with the testing or if it is quite far off then you have to go back to your ca model and then tweak it such that you come close to the physical crash test it could be as simple as changing the uh, material uh, model or it could be changing the weld pattern what you're using or some of the examples where you could play around to get your correlation close to your physical test next state of the art uh, so in the crash analysis field uh, right now model 3 from tesla is considered um, like a very good model it was wholly and solely developed using finite element model uh, approach because if you see they were so confident with models and the uh, and techniques of building the model or representing the joints and connections that they kind of skipped the soft tooling part so during the vehicle developmental stage soft tooling is is one of the stages of the vehicle development where you build a very few vehicles using a, a soft tool and using the soft tool you can just create uh, like maybe 20 30 parts of per uh, vehicle and then you can use that to build a vehicle and then uh, you can do your crash analysis tesla was so confident with the model 3 uh, with the fe model what they had they eliminated the soft tooling they directly went into hard tooling and they built the final product so because of their confidence in the finite element model so the design to final product was for them was a little over a year so the whole developmental cycle for model 3 was just less than a year and everything was developed in finite element i know people who have worked on this and they have spent a lot of hours at work but everything was done in finite element i mean if you look at an example over here uh, where it shows the model 3 uh, peeled out you can see the multiple layers of material they've used to overcome the side crash analysis so they've used mild steel for the exterior they've used high strength steel they've used ultra high strength steel this car meets meets ihs top safety pick like as it's shown in the results over here it they performed really well in small overlap uh, which is one of the challenging load cases uh, these days and they have done it using like ultra high strength steel door rings this was all done using finite element analysis evolution in crash analysis so what is expected in future and what is going on in the field right now so always uh, modeling will improve the correlation so to, to get better correlation with the physical test you always have to keep improving your modeling techniques so 
companies like uh, Tesla, GM, or this thing, they have huge, massive teams which do this kind of a research where they're trying to improve their modeling techniques to get closer to that physical crash test. Like some of the examples will be like windshield modeling, which is something I worked on recently. Uh, because the better representation of the windshield cracking during a crash event kind of changes the overall performance of the vehicle in a frontal crash event. Without that being modeled correctly, you don't capture the full physical simulation part of it. Uh, similarly, it's the tire modeling. Uh, as I mentioned, like the small overlap load case uh, from IHS is a very challenging load case. The load goes directly into the tire and the tire um, kind of digs into the occupant compartment. And if we don't model this tire in a detailed pattern, you won't be able to simulate that phys- what happens in the physical world. And that's why a lot of OEMs getting into modeling the tires and uh, modeling the crush pattern of the tires and the, the wheel rims. Next comes joint modeling. This is really, really crucial. As I mentioned when I was, uh, told you about the front crush box modeling, the way you model the spot rails or the SPRs, that is your rivets in aluminum, it's really crucial because if we don't get this right, you, you won't get the desired crush pattern. What you see in the physical crash test, you won't see that in, in your FE world. So you have to capture this. And then this is done by a lot of, lot of iterations. Um, you have, I mean, like a lot of physical tests are created where the SPRs and spot welds are put into like shear tests, uh, tension tests, and then uh, you simulate that individual weld failures and then you put it into a component level analysis and then you put it into subcomponent analysis and then you check and check and verify at every stage between CAE and physical test. So that's how like the development phase works. So these things take a long time, but it's a necessary investment. And going to the improvement in the dummy models, on the right-hand side, you see a Thor 50th male dummy. Uh, this is a, one of the newer dummies which have been required to be used uh, nowadays in analysis. It's not yet started, uh, but I think it will be coming into this thing maybe probably next year or the year after. And this is a very sophisticated dummy because it's got more sensors, it's got more data acqu- acquisition uh, instruments in it where uh, you can get the dummy injury numbers, uh, which is like basically uh, rib deflections during a side impact or um, like tibia numbers and uh, leg numbers during a frontal crash event. So this is a pretty high-end model. Nowadays, OEMs would be required to use in their crash analysis. It's used for both front and side analysis. So that's a developmental, this thing which is happening in, in the field right now. Apart from that, uh, like I mentioned, uh, there are newer test cases which keep coming up every year. Uh, not every year, but every so many years. Um, like a few years ago, small offset was a new load case which was developed by IHS. And at that point, it was a very challenging load case uh, for the OEMs to meet because there was nothing like this developed. And this uh, small offset was created in such a way that it misses all the critical load paths, which the car is pretty, pretty much designed for. And nobody was uh, prepared for this such a load case where it misses all their load path. So once it misses the load path, then it becomes uh, pretty critical to meet such a load case. And nowadays, OEMs have started adding structures in the path of this barrier so that they can mitigate this load case. Apart from that, there is something called as the oblique crash load case, which is coming up for the frontal. The challenging part about this uh, load case is the airbags have to be totally redesigned because the current airbags wouldn't work for this load case. So these are all the different challenges which we keep seeing when newer and newer load cases uh, come into the picture. So similarly uh, with the autonomous vehicle, so uh, this is the future where a lot of companies in OEM are talking about uh, bringing autonomous driving into as of one of the features and uh, there are different vehicles and these vehicles are talking about different occupant orientations. That means uh, you won't be t- sitting typically how you uh, sit in a regular vehicle. Uh, here they're talking about where the seats can turn around. I mean, that is not a law yet. I mean, which uh, the seats are not allowed to turn, but just a food for thought where companies are thinking about where the seats can turn around and occupant is not even looking at the road and he's looking at the other occupants like this could be like a traveling pod or a vehicle of the future. 
where the occupant is not looking at the road, the seats are all turned around. So how do you protect the occupant? So this becomes the biggest challenge. How do you, where do you put the uh, airbag? How do you put the seat belts if the occupants keep turning around? Like you have to mount the seat belts to the seat or where do you mount it? So these are all uh, development th- things happening in the field as of today. Career path and opportunities for crash analysis. Okay, so career path uh, uh, for a crash analysis engineer. So uh, he can get into a structural crash analysis, which is like a full vehicle crash analysis. Uh, it could be either frontal, side, rear impact. And there is a lot and lot of crash analysis load cases if, because if you take the region that like it's either North America, Europe or Asia, India, China, uh, Japan, and the Chinese load cases, there is a lot of load cases that uh, go on and each one has its own little bit of a nuance where the speed is a little bit different, the dummies are a little different. And as a crash engineer, you need to have a good understanding of this and then how to simulate these load cases and then do it in a, the proper way so that you get a meaningful result. So that is one branch, which is called as the structural crash. The next one is the uh, dummy specialist. Uh, so structural analysis engineer, I mean, structural crash guy too, sometimes uses a dummy. But dummy specialist is somebody who works with the dummy constant basis where because making a dummy work with the full vehicle is a different ball game on its own because the dummy has so many uh, sensors and so many points of calibration. So to implement that into a full vehicle model and run that and to get a meaningful result, it takes a lot of time. So there are people who specialize in dummies and there are people who have never worked with a dummy at all. That's why I decided to divide that into two different fields where one is a crash structural guy and then another one is a dummy specialist. And then apart from that, there is an airbag specialist. So these guys are very pretty critical in developing the airbags because the airbags have to be folded in a particular uh, way to simulate how it is done in real life and then deployed during a crash event in finite element. So they do this day in and day out where they are working with airbags and they create these small models where the airbag deploys in the correct way it should. And trust me when I'm saying this is not going to be a small job because getting the airbags to deploy and simulate, it's a pretty important job and uh, pretty crucial. Apart from that, uh, there is something called as an interior CAE analysis. So imagine an occupant inside a a vehicle and during a crash event, he can hit his head on uh, various things in uh, around him. Either it could be like a door handle, it could be the steering column, or it could be something on the IP. So the interior CA analysis engineer um, will be doing that, where he'll be taking a head form. And then he, there are uh, standard points which uh, an OEM has to meet. Apart from that, based on the design of the vehicle itself, they'll have to show that they can pass this uh, interior CA uh, requirement for the vehicles to be sold. So that is the job of uh, interior CA analysis guy. And then uh, lastly, but not least, is the pedestrian uh, protection. So this, the role of this crash analysis engineer is to protect the uh, occupant outside the vehicle. These are people, uh, what we call as a vulnerable road users. And they could be people who are walking on the road or people who are cycling on the road. And uh, we do crash analysis for that too, where we make sure that vehicles are designed in such a way that it co- doesn't cause serious injuries even during a crash event. So they create, uh, they add uh, design uh, iterations in the vehicle, uh, which will make it suitable for the per- pedestrians or the cyclists on the road. So that is also a pretty crucial uh, part of the crash analysis and people do this as a separate um, entity itself. Apart from that, coming to the job opportunities. So in uh, for job opportunities, there are like various OEMs uh, in US itself, like OEMs like Tesla, GM, Ford, and Chrysler. And there are uh, numerous startups coming up on a day-to-day basis. And there's so many startups which are still in stealth mode and nobody has heard of them too. Like that, there are a com- lot of companies. So there is like startups like Nikola, Rivian, Karma. Then there are tier one suppliers like Bentler Automotive. All of these companies do crash analysis in some form or the other. Uh, coming to in India, there are different OEMs like GM Tech Center in uh, India, and then the Ford Tech Center, 
Then there is the Mercedes Benz tech center also is all based in India. Other than that, there are uh, numerous startups which I've heard about in India too, like which are doing crash analysis. So there is a lot of opportunities for a crash engineer. And this is something which will be always required because you need to, somebody needs to do this analysis part even for a startup or for a major OEM. Otherwise, you'll be losing the benefits of saving cost or your design time during a crash event.